Monday, you're watching Entertainment Week. Coming up on the show... Paddington director Paul King is here to tell us about bringing the bear to life. Bruna Keating on trading Boyzone for treading the boards in the musical Once. The British soldiers whose ordeal in Afghanistan has inspired the new movie Kajaki. And Angelina Jolie on stepping behind the camera and a possible future in politics. Well, first, let's catch up on all the week's entertainment news, a warning that there is some flash photography coming up. The novelist P.D. James has died aged 94. Selling millions of books, she rose to fame writing about sleuth Adam Dalgleish. She also wrote The Children of Men and Death Comes to Pemberley. Take That have snubbed Spotify and signed up with its rival Google Play to exclusively stream their new album, Three, for one month. ACDC drummer Phil Rudd made a shambolic appearance in a New Zealand court to face drugs charges and an allegation he threatened to kill. He arrived late, then as he left, got a piggyback from one of his bodyguards. It's been a good week for One Direction. They've made US chart history after all four of their albums debuted at number one. The boy band also won three gongs at the American Music Awards. In film news, Michael Fassbender will take on Steve Jobs in a new biopic directed by Danny Boyle after Christian Bale, well, Bale's. Natalie Portman will also star. Ridley Scott has confirmed that Harrison Ford will return for Blade Runner 2. And Meryl Streep and Stevie Wonder received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama. Now, he's been a much-loved fixture of children's literature for over 50 years. Now, Paddington Bear, along with his battered suitcase and old hat, has made the journey from the page to the big screen via Peru, of course, and Paddington Station. And he's getting into just as much trouble as he was in the books. Nice weather for the ducks. Oh. That was amazing. <laughs> and the director and writer Paul King is with me now. Um, Paul, I have seen the film ahead of its release this weekend. And just to sum it up, it's like a big bear hug, uh, albeit a soggy one from that <laughs> clip. I mean, the reviews have been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. Uh, and you must be hugely relieved because it's your personal interpretation of what is a national treasure. It is. It's been... It's a huge responsibility because I think everyone has strong ideas of what Paddington is, whether they've grown up with the toys or the stop frame animation in the 70s as I did or, or later versions or the books and and you're sort of really aware of playing with something that's very dear to people's hearts and that's really exciting because Paddington's a great character it's a big universal story with some great heart and great comedy but there's also you know you have to be careful with it and certainly when Michael Bond was watching the film I was extremely <laughs> anxious as to what he thought of it but he was fortunately uh, overjoyed so that was a great weight off my shoulders. Um, it was a shock for a lot of people to see Paddington in CGI in, in the build-up to this release yes. and there was a lot of controversy wasn't there particularly online I think there was hashtag creepy Paddington and a lot of memes out there on the internet as to how he actually looked because it is quite far removed from the illustrations we're used to from the books and um, having seen the film I must admit he's not as creepy as the internet <laughs> made him out to be at all he's perfectly lovable but were you pleased with how he how he looked because you've got no control really over gra graphics and animation have you? We went back to the first illustrations, Peggy Fortnum, who drew him in the 1958 Bear Called Paddington and did the sort of first 15 years where he's much more of a, a bear. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to tell the story of a bear. He's not a teddy bear, he's a real bear from Darkest Brew, well, as, as real as a Paddington bear is ever going to be. Um, but we wanted him to feel like a bear that you've brought into your house and all the chaos and, and you know, uh, shenanigans that would happen with that rather than just a sort of sweet little teddy bear. He is a wild animal. And, and that's the story of the film is, can you really let a wild animal into your heart? Yeah, and you you can see all the antics in the bathroom there. I remember that from the book. But what I don't remember is an evil taxidermist who's trying to kill Paddington. That's quite a dark <laughs> twist to the, to the film. Where did that come from? And Nicole Kidman in a sort of Cruella de Vil kind of role. I suppose what we wanted to do was explore... Uh, the Browns are very welcoming to Paddington and a bit, a bit reluctant at 
to begin with, but, but we wanted some people who weren't quite so sure that a bear really belonged in London and to sort of have a story with some adventure and some peril. And, and it is a big story, Paddington. It starts with that, you know, that he loses his family, he travels around the world, and, and, and we sort of felt we needed to keep the story going all the way through the film. And certainly the ending seems to, to be terrifically exciting. But it's not Paddington in Peril from Nicole Kidman in this film that got its, its PG certificate. Uh, it was a cross-dressing Hugh Bonneville. Um, explain what that's all about. Well, Hugh, as we can see, is an extremely attractive man. <laughs> and uh, there, is, <laughs> there is a scene in, in the film where Hugh dresses up as a cleaning lady in sort of classic widow twanky style to sort of sneak in somewhere and, and get some information that Paddington needs. Uh, which was deemed initially to be a bit sexual. <laughs> I can assure everyone there is nothing sexual in Having Paddington Having seen it, yeah, whatsoever. it's more Panto Dame than anything else. Do you think the film sense has got it wrong? I, I, I think, to be fair, Paddington gets in some big scrapes and you can see him going down the stairs and he sort of, you know, he runs up down escalators and he sort of hides in fridges and he does things that very, very little young viewers might need don't try this Clarifying. at home. Exactly. Mm. Don't try this at home. It's fine for a for a talking bear, but it's not fine for for a three year old. And I think to clarify that is absolutely fine and perfectly responsible. And lots of kids' films are PG, like Toy Story and Frozen, and I think Stuart Little. And uh, it, it's a normal rating, but it's really a very f broad spectrum film that can appeal to four and 84 alike. And it's a good excuse for the parents to be able to go along as well. Um, Paul King, thank you very much and good luck with opening weekend. Thank, thank you. you for having now, he spent years performing in front of thousands of people as a member of Boyzone and as a solo star. Uh, so you'd have thought stage fright was a thing of the past for Ronan Keating. But as he makes his theatre debut in the musical Once, he's told Sky's Ender Brady about the terror of taking to the West End stage. We've seen Ronan, the boy band superstar, we've seen Ronan Keating, the solo artist. How does it feel to be Ronan Keating in the West End? Yeah, you're very exposed, you know, that was one of the scary things for me. As a pop star, uh, you can hide behind your band, you can hide behind the dance moves, you can hide behind, you know, backing tracks and so on like that. Not that I ever mimed, but you still have all, you know, layered vocals and so on. So you have a place to hide most of the time. On this stage, there is nowhere to hide. Uh, and that was kind of the, you know, one of the things that interested me. After 21 years of doing it, I needed this challenge. And by God, has it been a challenge. And, and I have been scared. I have, uh, you know, worried, um, anxious. But I am so glad I took the role on. And it's been an honor to work with these guys and work in this show with this, uh, you know, just with, with something as meaty and, and as, as incredible as this story. You've been in show business 20 plus years now, hard to believe, but yeah. your West End debut, how nervous were you? Incredibly nervous, never saw myself uh, as someone who would do West End or Broadway. Had been offered different things, but never thought it was for me. Stephen Gately loved it. I love going to the West End, love seeing the shows, and we kind of left it to steal. Um, but it was this show that really, that took my interest. Um, it's very different, it's not a jazz hands musical. You are an X Factor judge. You're yeah. up there. You're, you're Simon Cowell. You're Gary Barlow. Some <laughs> weeks you're Louis. Some weeks as well. Oh, um, how does that feel, judging young up and coming singers when you know you started out at 17, 18, and, and you you were that person? Well, I guess after 20 years, I feel I I can, I can stand there and go, yeah, I know what it takes. I know what I'm looking for. Uh, and the beauty is there's four judges and everybody's looking for something different. So I'm not saying I'm the, the all-seeing eye by any means, but I know what I'm looking for. Ronan at 18, had X Factor been on TV back then? Would you have got would through? Would I have done it? Would you have uh, yeah. done it? Would you have got through? Would I have got through? Probably not. Would I have done it? Yeah, I would. Uh, I, absolutely. It's, it's harder now than ever to get a deal, to be seen, to be heard. Record companies are, you know, are disappearing and you know for many different reasons and yeah i think i would have you know because that's you know you need opportunities like that to be seen to be heard and the christmas bells that ring there are the clanging band aid 30 we've all seen the headlines and the great record and the great things that that cash will go towards were you slightly surprised at some of the negativity around geldof and bono whatever works if it makes people put their hand in their pocket well then so be it um yeah, you don't need negativity surrounding it, and there'll always be some people that, you know, want 
to create negativity about it or you know an artist that'll say something maybe because they weren't happy that they weren't on it or whatever it may be but you know it's a great thing at the end of the day it's a great thing it's raising money for people that need it well coming up we're joined by the british soldier and the actor who plays him in the war drama kajaki and is angelina jolie about to make a move into politics In 2006, a unit of British paratroopers found itself in jeopardy when they were stranded in a minefield in Afghanistan. What followed was a dramatic and ultimately tragic rescue mission. Their experience has now been made into the film Kajaki, a true story. One here, boss. Kill five, bravo. Main strike. Man down, mate. What it's all about, that's the water. Got burn pit. There's about 16 odd here at Athens, seven, eight up at Normandy. And your mum looks hotter every month. <laughs> Taking eight up here. A few Chinese rockets, bit of boom boom in the valley. Well, that's it. It's lucky because we're out of ammo. Well, Lance Corporal Paul Tug Hartley is the medic who treated the injured on the ground. And Game of Thrones star Mark Stanley plays him in the movie. And um, Tug, I'll come to you first. This all happened back in 2006. It was a routine patrol with your men and explain to us what happened next. Yeah, there was a, an illegal uh, Taliban vehicle checkpoint. A three-man patrol went out to try and eradicate the situation and unfortunately one of the guys detonated a mine en route. From that, ten of us went in as a rescue party and things just went from bad to worse. Uh, and Mark, you played Tug in the movie. You must have felt a huge sense of responsibility with recreating these real-life events and the, the seriousness of what happened to these men. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's always in, that's always in the forefront of your mind, you know, when you, when you take on a project like this. Um, you're dealing with someone's life and, and a pivotal role, a pivotal moment in that person's life. Um, so you try, and, you try and approach it with as much respect um, as you can and, and try and give it a dignified and... Um, you know, show them in the best possible light when you're doing that. And Tug, you have seen the film. What was it like to watch somebody play you on the big screen and, and to see the events that unfolded that day up there? Yeah, to see myself being portrayed, um, I still find it quite surreal, to be fair. Um, but I think overall, I think the film's great for the, for the guys who were there. I think it'll um, give a bit of closure on the incident. Um, you know, we've all got our own opinions of what happened that day, and I think the film has done well to sort of combine all our stories and it'll answer a few of the questions and eradicate some of the demons that the guys had from that experience. And Mark, it's a, a gritty and, and harrowing story and there's always the danger of, of war films being dominated by big explosions and action scenes and this film isn't like that. It's very much uh, a tense, the drama between the men and the what would you do scenario. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, we've, in, as far as the Afghanistan war goes, um, you know, we're, we're, we're remaining impartial to that, really. You know, you can make your own mind up as to what we've gained or not gained by being over there. You know, uh, this story focuses on the brotherhood of those boys that were, that were out there together um, and, you know, dealing with the composure that they were able to display on the day and, and those horrific events. Um, but it's absolutely, it's more to do with the dynamic of the characters uh, and what relationship and what, what they're willing to do to save each other's lives. And there's one particular scene that's been, been called the backpack scene, and, and this actually happened to you, Tug, and it shows that trying to get out of that minefield, you had to use any means necessary. Explain what happened. Yeah, it's um, improvising. You know, it's, we were stuck there, and you know, a, no, a number of other casualties happened, and I was the only medic remaining. Um, the other medic, Alex Craig, was severely injured and was helped out of the minefield, and I was with one injured party where there was three more injured over the other side, so I picked my backpack up, I threw it, it didn't go bang, so I jumped onto it and repeated that till, till I got across the minefield to help them out. I mean, how hard was it to film something like that, the sheer terror that Tug must have been experiencing? Well, I mean, you know, the credit, the credit belongs to Tug, um, you know, who actually went through those, through that situation and were dealing with the actual, the actual stakes of life and death. Um, as far as the filming process goes, you know, obviously it's a, it's a dramatised moment uh, and we tried to make it as realistic as we could. Um, your imagination can latch in so far, but, you know, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg with that sort of stuff. And Tug, having seen the film, do you see yourself as a hero? No. Um, I, I was a British soldier. There's thousands of stories they could have chose from, you know, to put this film out with the chose hours. Um, 
and to categorise me as a hero, you'd need to categorise every British serviceman, you know, and woman who's out there. Yeah. All heroes in our eyes. Um, Target Mark Stanley, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us thank about you. Kajaki. It's out this weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, she may be one of the most recognisable women in the world, but for her latest film, Angelina Jolie has stepped behind the camera. The star has directed Unbroken, the story of Olympic athlete Louis Samperini, who spent years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. She spoke to Sky News at the film's premiere in London. not often we see Angelina Jolie, director. Why this story? Oh, I, I couldn't think of a... Of a, of a I, I wanted to spend years of my life near somebody like this man. I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to believe myself. I wanted to be around something that would inspire me to, to carry on and, and raise my children better and, and uh, be in a... Uh, be a when, you, when you think about, about Louis, you, you are reminded of all that is great about what is inside all of us. And I, I, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to know that. I wanted to walk his footsteps. I wanted to know how he survived. He's so extraordinary. He went through so much. I, I, um, he's, he's a hero. He's a hero of mine. And is it true that you are so comfortable as a director? This may be it for acting. You may retire acting and become a director full time, as it were. I have a few more things I'll do as an actress, but I'd be very happy to at some point. Just and, stay behind the camera. And of course your other role is a humanitarian. You've done a lot of work with William Hague. Would you ever be tempted to become a politician as well? I will do whatever I, wherever I'm useful, I will go. I will do whatever I can. Um, you know, you never know what, where life's going to take you. And you've had a fantastic year, obviously. Just tell us about uh, meeting the Queen and receiving that honorary damehood. Uh, it meant a great deal to me because it was for foreign service and uh, my work with PSVI, which which I want to dedicate my life to to these these causes. And, and you always hope that when you work on these issues that that you are making a difference. And and um, and it was a it was very it gave me that support to feel that, that we are actually making a difference. And, and, and we're to begin. We, we have a lot more work to do. Well, time now to see what's on at the cinema this weekend. And one of the big releases is the sequel to the comedy Horrible Bosses. Boom! Marker drop. Kidnapping. That's kidnapping. With one more P it is, that's kidnapping. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about kidnapping. Think about it, okay, first of all, we kidnap Rex, that's right? right? Yeah. We get money from Bert, yeah. we the save the money. business. What do you know about executing a kidnapping? But what do you mean? You get you zip, zip, zip ties. We're not gonna kidnap anyone. Uh, well, Joe is with us, and Joe, you've seen uh, this film. I have seen Horrible Bosses yeah. 1. Um, I don't remember liking it that much. <laughs> what, Do you remember anything from Horrible Bosses? No, well? I just remember thinking, yeah. Because this was my problem with Horrible Bosses too. because mm. I went to it with exactly the same reaction, going, I must have seen Horrible Bosses, but I can't really remember anything <laughs> about it. It's probably not the greatest uh, tribute to a film. And this, I think, if you like the first one, you'll probably like this one. I mean, they've kept with a lot of the same things that made it work, which is this thing with comedy sequels, isn't it? You either go bigger and brasher, like mm. they did with Anchorman 2, or you sort of uh, do same scenario, like the Hangover series. They've gone for a little bit of both here. I mean, it made $210 million at the box office, so a sequel really was always going to happen, which is amazing, isn't yeah. it, considering no one can understand, uh, remember it, really. And I think you'll come out of this and you think, yeah, OK for a Friday night film, but if you ask me in four weeks' time what happens in this film, I probably won't be able to tell you. But Jennifer Aniston makes her sort of cameo role, really, as the sexed, craved uh, Dr Julia. Um, if you remember her from Rachel from Friends, you all sit there like this. You can't believe she's saying this. No, not things. Rachel. <laughs> exactly, which is exactly what I asked her about when I spoke to her. Such a potty mouth in this movie. Party, party, party. party. Yes. Is it just a hell of a lot of fun? It's so much fun. There's nothing more fun than just being able to be a dress really well, mm -hmm. elegant, successful, established, and then just have that kind of 
Filth. Filth. It's a comedy, but there's a lot of Oscar winners in here. So Christopher Waltz, Jamie Foxx, Kevin Spacey. Brought the gold, right? But what's it like when you have like sort of you know the the, the higher echelons of acting talent have been awarded by their peers? You don't think about you know they don't walk in with a little golden statue <laughs> floating around their head. I just want, I treat them as I treat all actors I work with who I think are extraordinary and. F fabulous comedians and actors. Just finally, I, I haven't seen it yet, but everyone's talking about it could be you next year. Horrible Bosses 3, we could be adding your name to the Oscar winner list in the in, in the third movie with uh, Cake. With, oh, Do you take any yeah. notice of it? Are you, are you, all the buzz? Uh, uh, well, you can't help but not to, I would say. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just so flattered and so humbled and excited for the movie because we worked so hard on it and we it, it's so dear to our, our hearts okay let's move on to Paddington uh, yeah. I've seen this yeah and I loved it it's not really aimed at me um but Are you sure and, well, I don't <laughs> embrace know. your inner yeah, childhood I, I think there's a four-year-old in all of us <laughs> yeah. and uh, the four-year-old inside of me really like this one well I mean I, I think you forget there's actually a film release there's been so much controversy about the mm. sort of the classification stuff but I went with quite low expectations because obviously I've had a very deprived childhood and actually Paddington missed passed me by so oh. I Sort of went I had there. the omnibus edition. Yeah. I read it every <laughs> yeah. night. I loved it. So I went there thinking, oh, it's just going to be another kids' film. Mm. But it's not at all. I mean, uh, he turns up at Paddington Station at the start with that sort of thing around his neck saying, please look after this bear. And mm. the, the filmmakers iconic image. Mm. have taken note of that. I mean, it is marmaladen with wit and <laughs> whimsy and great British humour. I'm going to be really interested to see how it travels abroad, though, mm. because it does feel very British. And there was a lot of chat about, does uh, Paddington look too fox-like? But I think he looks just like a bear. And the guys at Framestore and Soho have done a great job. Voiced by Ben Whishaw, who you probably know from uh, Q in the Bond mm. series. There was chat that Colin Firth was going to be a Paddington. But he would have been just Apparently too he mature. Sounded too old. Yeah, yeah, he would have been. He's got, he's got it off to a T, hasn't he? Great supporting human cast as mm. well. Hugh Bonneville, uh, Sally uh, Hawkins. Uh, Nicole Kidman, who hams it up completely as mm. this villainous taxidermist who wants to stuff Paddington. Mm. And I think it deserves more. I want to see more Paddington. And uh, something else that's uh, coming up, another Jurassic Park film. Yeah. Now, I had to Google this. The last one was in 2001. It was ages ago. What, what's the update on this one? Well, I mean, if we weren't just talking about Star Wars all the time, we'd probably be talking about this. <laughs> I mean, the, the trailer's been released this week of uh, the new Jurassic Park movie. It's out next May, starring Chris Pratt, who, of course, we remember from Guardians of the Galaxy, who's now the bona fide go-to guy as uh, Hollywood's um, leading man. I think it looks a little bit CGI-ish. I think the, maybe the special effects in the 90s version looks a well, little I bit better if you watch the first one before going to see this one, you'd notice a massive difference. They really? hold up pretty well, to be fair. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I think it's got to be a reboot, hasn't it? Because since mm. the first, the, the, the next two movies kind of just went downhill a little bit. So if they reboot this, if it's a fun summer spectacular, I mean, who knows? But, yeah, I'm interested to see. Uh, and talking of reboot, Star Wars, the trailer yeah. out today. It's not out until the end of next year. We're talking about it every week, it seems. But, yes, we, we've finally got the first glimpse of footage in this trailer. Just, you know, just over a minute, really. I mean, not too much. J.J. Abrams, who directs it, is the master, isn't he, of suspense mm. and keeping people people coming. This is the first uh, bit of marketing for the movie. It was only going to be released in cinemas in the States on Friday night, but there was such an uproar from Star Wars fans online that's now being released on iTunes as well. And so we get the first glimpse. We're going to see so many glimpses and trailers coming up, but this is the first time we get to see what they've been doing up at Pinewood. So very exciting for Star Wars fans. OK, Jake, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, that's all for now. Here's what's coming up on next week's show. We'll be speaking to Michael Keaton about the breakout indie film that has a tip for awards glory. And the stars of The Hobbit finally say goodbye to Middle Earth.